Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Emos. I'm a student at, at Cornell Tech, and I'm very excited to be here and to take part in this uh, New York City Open Data Week and uh, show with you uh, some of my work, which is uh, basically in the intersection of nature, uh, generative forms of uh, making art, and some uh, data-driven processes that can help us uh, nurture uh, creativity and and have some fun. And we've been conducting in the last semester, uh, creating a generative framework that we call the Weaver. It draws its inspiration from the Pisarium and uh, showcases how it was used in a data-driven uh, process um, of designing a, a conceptual pavilion uh, on the mounts of uh, So I would start with a quote by a, a designer that I love, Neri Oxman. And I also use it in the description of the event. So uh, 3D printers adds materials in layer, layers, nature doesn't. Nature. So this is a quote by Nelly Oxman. She is an Israeli-American designer and professor at MIT Media Lab. And rather than exploring how multiple different materials can assemble an object, um, our exploration started by looking to nature and searching for a model that bears growth using a single material. To that extent, we were deeply inspired by the Fisarium. So the Fisarium is a slime mold, and it's popularly known as the blob. And on the left, you can see its growth over time. So here you can see the growth over time, how it expands and explores its 2D space. And on the right, you can see a more intentional growth. You can see the movement of the Fisarium control. So the red drops are were added on a, like a computer simulation. Actually, it's not exactly a computer simulation. It's more like a vid video editing kind of thing. And then um, it represented droplets of oatmeal. And um, so you can see how the Fisarium is growing over time and it's following the trace of uh, the droplets of oatmeal. And this was, this was taken by a risk by uh, Nate Sira. He's a researcher at Cornell um, in Ithaca working on the intersection of uh, biology and uh, natural forms of, uh, of growth in nature. So after being deeply fascinated by Fisarium, uh, we rolled up our sleeves and we started working on developing an algorithmic model that captures the movement of the Fisarium. So the Fisarium can be modeled as a collection of vertices and edges. And at each time step of the life cycle of the Fisarium, one of the following three states can happen. It could either grow, so a node further ex extends from the center of the Fisarium, retraction, it withdraws, it withdraws towards the center, and branching, the node split into two additional nodes. So combining these three states together results in movement. We name the final model that the, the final output, the weaver. And so here you can see a small simulation. And this was also based on innate serious work. And so we have, we managed to combine three different straight states to create movement. And we had this question of, okay, so this Fisarium is moving in space. So a little bit like what we saw on the real face serial simulation, it moves in space, but it's not necessarily really intentional. So what about intention? So we were interested in making this movement intentional. To achieve this, we modify the environment in which the face serum is operating, the weaver. We would call it the weaver from now on because now it has a name. We embedded the weaver space with pieces of food. And at each time step, the weaver nodes look at the closest piece of food and branches or grows towards it. The food pieces are not perennial, so once the node starts consuming a piece of food, um, they get decreased over time, and eventually they are completely removed out of the grid. And it's basically a way to incentivize the weaver to explore new regions in the space that were not explored before. So basically it would encounter a piece of food, it would approach to it, it would start consuming it at some point, it will disappear and then it would continue its exploration in this 2D or 3D space to find new pieces of food. And combining growth, retraction, branching with environment embedded with food uh, results in the first tangible weaver representation. So this is, uh, it's alive. So just to sum up a little bit the different steps that we did, we looked at nature, we saw the Fisarium moving on a 2D Tetri plate. We took this 2D representation, we transformed it into a 3D representation, and we embedded pieces of food that correspond with the oatmeal droplets, in, uh, which are, they're not circles anymore, they're spheres. And here you can see how, the, how our uh, little weaver is 
So the little weaver is this silverish blob moving in this 3D space. And uh, the blue spheres are basically the food or the pieces of oatmeal, and it's moving in space and consuming these pieces of oatmeal. And as I said, we started with a 2D dimension. We augmented it to 3D, but we wanted more. So we started amusing with the idea of introducing toxic food. So basically all the pieces of food that are available on the grid are consumable up until this point are consumable by the weaver. And uh, we wanted to start exploring what could happen if we introduce toxic food that makes the weaver feel sick and uh, induces aversion. Here we can see that we can we introduced a new set of um, food, toxic food. And once the weaver in the exploration of the space, when the weaver meets a toxic food, instead of intersecting it and trying to consume it, it would basically go uh, around it and, and avoid it. So we introduced a new set of food, a toxic set of food. And uh, to make things even more interesting, we wanted to see what happens when two weavers operate in the same environment um, with two sets of food where each weaver is avoiding each other's food. So two weavers and two sets of food, such as each set of food is edible for one weaver and toxic for the other weaver. So here is like a small, a nice a graphic of the conceptual idea. And we went ahead and we actually implemented it. So we combined two weavers with two sets of food. On the left, we can observe the magenta weaver operating on an environment with two sets of food. It is avoiding the two large blue uh, spheres and consuming the red food present around it. And similarly, on the right, we have a magenta and cyan weaver consuming the red and blue foods, respectively, avoiding uh, crossing uh, paths or trespassing each other regions and basically working harmonically uh, to complete the task of consuming all the pieces of food and that our synthetic nature has to offer. So we have this rich set of parameters. We managed to figure out how to make multiple weaver agents to operate together in the same space. But the question that remains is how we can harness our weaver and make it build something for us. In the simulation, we can see how the weaver evolves over time, but there is no actual trace to how much time was spent in a specific region or how it evolves over time. So here we play a simple game of connect the dots and we unveil the potential of the weaver to become a builder and communicate data insights. So basically we, by connecting the itinerary of each weaver across all time steps, we obtain a 3D object. So you can see the 3D object on the right and the intricate branching system lives harmonically and does not intersect with each other. In other words, the two weaver agents operating do not intersect paths. This path you can see here corresponds with the movement of the magenta weaver consuming the blue pieces of food. And the brownish path corresponds with the, sorry, it's the blue one is the cyan weaver and the brown one is the magenta weaver. So we have this kind of intricate object that represents, it's a history basically of how the weaver operates in space and consumes its environment. So I showcased a little bit the model, just one second. Um, so I showcased the model that we, we developed to represent data. And um, I'll just reiterate uh, our task, task statement. So we are interested in using the Weaver uh, to produce a conceptual design for a pavilion at Cornell Tech. So our model is ready to be deployed. And the main question left is how we can harness the power of the model, incorporate the env environmental conditions of where we want to place the pavilion. So it's the mounts of Cornell Tech. So we started exploring different conditions presented in our environment and distilled four forces of community and nature that we want to have involved in the process. So the first one is heat. Uh, we want our pavilion to be energy optimized and people would be comfortable staying inside of it without feeling too hot or too cold. So the pavilion should provide sufficient cover and optimization for sun exposure to create an, an oh, sorry to create an energy efficient pavilion. And the second one is force. So when we build a pavilion you, or any kind of structure, you need to make sure the structure won't collapse on the people that are staying inside of it. We did uh, a force analysis uh, to understand uh, how the pavilion should be built in an optimized way to sustain its own weight. 
The third one is geometry, which is our input as designers and the macro level 3D shape uh, that we would love our pavilion to take. And the last one is where it becomes interesting for, for all of us. And I think the reason we all came here is the words and data points from the NYC recycling data set. So we want to incorporate feedback from the community in the form of textual input. So from the community level, we have two pieces of information that are incorporated in the design process. The first one is the actual rates of uh, recycling and uh, diversion in New York City. And the second one is the textual input that we collected from our community. So just without getting too much into the technicalities of how we took all these data points and we transformed them into, into a numerical space, especially for the text. So the other factors are relatively trivial, but word representation is a unique challenge because by definition, words do not have a spatial, spatial representation. And so to overcome this, we use uh, NLP techniques to transform the words into a numerical representation. Essentially, words that are semantically similar will appear closer to each other in the numerical space. Um, so we basically collect input from the community on Roosevelt Island in the form of poems, stories, personal experiences. We use word to vec uh, to transform the words on a couple of hundred of uh, dimension. We transform the words um, to vectors over multiple hundreds of dimensions and using a technique called the uh, dimensionality reduction, more specific, specifically an algorithm that is called UMAP, we conduct the dimensionality reduction uh, to represent the collected words in a smaller dimension in 3D space, which are then projected on our pavilion. It's very abstract now, but I will drill inside the details in now. Here you can see the, our sandwich model. So the different environmental conditions explored are transformed into layers that are placed on top of each other uh, in our final pavilion. So we're uh, going back to the weaver, the production of each layer consists of one weaver and one set of food, one set of food. And the set of food that we spread in the 3D space correspond with the data points that was collected by this environmental uh, condition. And the weaver is basically living its life and consuming these different sets of food. And while it's consuming these different sets of food, it basically generates a layer in our final pavilion. This is a proposed framework for how we can actually produce the pavilion. We can gloss over it, but basically we're using this very fancy a, a Boston dynamic robot that is, we have the weaver algorithm implemented inside of it and it's dropping um, a material that is called chitin, which was also developed by uh, Neri Oxman at MIT Media Lab. It's a mixture of, of uh, the shells of, uh, of seafood with water, and it's a very sustainable material. It's, it dries basically upon exposure to sun. And the PVA is the material that we are using for, for the template. It's PVA is eco-friendly material, but again, it's just a proposed concept of how and this production process could work. And here you can basically see the simulation. So we developed a fully fledged modeling app that consists of a WebSocket Python server that runs the Weaver model and the front web app that communicated with the server and renders its output using a WebGL technology. And so the app takes a, as input multiple parameters, but are, as you can see from the visualization above for the same actually this so this is the visualization overall and you cannot see the pieces of food in this 3d space but the the beams that are being created are basically the trace of the weaver over time and the weaver is moving uh, during, through space and consuming the pieces of food that are um, transparent here but they are obviously they are present and this is what basically uh, incentivizing the weaver to move over in space here you can see how so it's a generative model. You can input different parameters to it. And by inputting different parameters, you get outputs that are fundamentally uh, different from each other. When you run the model on the exact same parameters multiple times, it would al always output a different form. So here you can see, but we don't really need to go into details about how the parameter, how the model works, but you can see that small tweaks in, in the different parameters, for example, the growth rate, and results in uh, forms that are could be more sparse or more dense with more holes. And we were using the small web app to explore 
how tweaking these parameters could produce different results. Here, here, are, here are like three other cuts of uh, views of different outputs made by the Weaver algorithm. Once again, uh, tweaking the different parameters for the, the same 3D macro level shape, and we get textures that are, that are very different. So the power of the Weaver stems from its capacity of actively uh, creating patterns, text, textures, and shape. And um, so in this matrix drawing, you can see how a, a wide spectrum of shapes of the weaver is capable, the, the weaver is capable to operate and demonstrating its capacity of conquering any challenge. So here we're using um, different templates and we are letting the weaver explore the food distribution within these different templates. And we can see that for each template, we get a different intricate texture and we love to call it a universal space filling curve. So that fancy way uh, um, to name what you're seeing here. Um, so going back to the pavilion, here you can see a map of Coleltex mounds. And uh, these hexagons here represent uh, the final pavilion and where it's going to be placed. And uh, the sandwich model, so each layer corresponding with a different environmental condition that we are exploring, being all sandwiched together. This is the final rendering of, of a generative data-driven pavilion. And here you can see another view from within the pavilion. So that's pretty much it on my side. I am open to questions if there is something that was not very... So there, I guess there are some aspects that are pretty technical. And do not hesitate if there is something I see, Jody, you're raising your hand. Yes, go ahead. Hi there. Um, Hi. Very fascinating. Actually, the other people on here are composters and recycling garbage geeks. So I was like, oh, slime molds and data. That's exciting. What, can you talk to me about why you picked the recycling data to, to generate this pavilion? I think so. Fundamentally, it's like an architectural project and how generative models can be used in working in architecture. And I think there is this um, phenomena in architecture where, especially from what we see in like these days, it's very resource consuming. So people would like, so even like when we look at the Olympic games, people will harvest a lot of materials from all around the world and metal and natural resources to create this huge building that are not necessarily energy optimized. And, and in some ways we are trying to build, build stuff that are not meant to be built with these materials and it's never long lasting. And even when you try to go on these ambitious projects, oftentimes it ends up being a failure and doesn't really work well on the long term. So I think the recycling data set was. So there is obviously a very aesthetical uh, aspect to it. So how we can use recycling data set to represent an aesthetical, uh, an aesthetical a model from an aesthetic perspective. And it's in a way, it's also a criticism because architecture and build, especially when we're trying to make something that is very, I don't have the word, but it results in a lot of waste. So here I'm trying to showcase how we can use sustainable materials and they build something that is more natural. So using a generative model that is inspired from nature and using a data set that represents um, our will and our need to put focus on recycling and making sure that our life is more sustainable. I, I originally thought, oh, slime molds, we could map more efficient curbside routes because that's the mayor's reason for stopping curbside pickup of food scraps. But now I'm like, oh, we could get rid of concrete now because if concrete manufacturing was a country, it would have the third largest greenhouse gas emissions behind the U.S. and China. So this is a very, uh, very interesting approach to sustainability. So is the, I'm a real newbie to data, and I presume you're talking about using 3D printing techniques with this construction project. And the objective is to raise consciousness by making it a public art display using the data set. Is that 
the purpose of it. I want to make sure I understand it. That is precise. That is exactly correct. So the 3D printer, so I, I would say that initially the, the initial idea to create something tangible was to use this 3D visualization that you can basically see here to allow people explore the data set and tweak their parameters on their own. So for the time being, I'm still working on uh, refining the framework, but I'm going to render this framework uh, completely uh, open source and anyone could could have access to it and play with it. And even so I'm using a, a, a recycling data set, but it could a potential user can input any type of data set and play with the parameters and explore the different shapes that are um, that are created. But yeah, ideally, like the best thing to do is uh, create a 3D uh, sculpture, yeah, a 3D eco-friendly sc sculpture and uh, allow people to interact with it in a, in a medium that is more tangible. But this taking, like, taking the pro this project to the next step usually. So in 3D printers, there is also a lot of waste. The materials that are used are often not very eco-friendly. So there is this, this solution of keeping is Basically, you can use it to print something and it's completely organic. So it's not perennial. So once it's been, it's exposed to environmental conditions and rain and it, it decays and basically it could get absorbed back to the earth in a form, in a form of compost. Yeah, no, I'm not sure if I, I think I a little bit, I went a little bit around different tangential lines, but. So is the, you call it chitin? Please pronounce it chitin and know the difference. But is it mixed with the PVA in the production process or the PVA is separate? I presume PVA is some variation of plastic, right? Yeah. So it's not mixed with the PVA. So here, so we also, I did not go into the exact structure of the final pavilion, but we wanted to leverage the mounts of Cornell to create these. So we, the idea was to place the PVA on the mounts and then print with the chitin on top of the PVA. And then the PVA is a, it's a plastic that is a dissolvable in water and it's, it dissolves in water faster than chitin. So the idea was to um, print the chitin on the PVA and then wash away the PVA with water and the resulting output is, so here you can see it with the PVA, but the resulting output would only be the blue part of the shell. So only the part that was printed with the chitin. Oh, okay. So it, is the, is the structure constructed indoors so that you cannot get rain on it then? So it's constructed outdoors directly on the mounds. And the idea is to construct it over the summer and to have this structure decay over time uh, with wow. environmental conditions. And when it returns back to ground, chitin is it's, it's compost. So it also nourishes its environment. It was, so it's a sculpture, uh, uh, an evolving constellation over time. It has some functionality because it was optimized to be structurally strong and, and for sun exposure. And it's very conceptual. Like I would, not, I'm not, I would never propose it as a working proposal for any for any company commissioning a pavilion because uh, there is more analysis that should be done to make sure that it's it really works, but. This is the conceptual framework. Okay. I, I was going to say, it, it reminds me of something else, which is I have a brother okay. in California who lives in an earth house or it's built into the ground and it was designed by Lloyd Turner. And I don't know if you're an architecture type, but he created these forms that you build out of metal and then you put this concrete on top of it. And then when the concrete dries on the forms, the structure is really sturdy and it's open source, basically. You can go online and find Lloyd Turner's designs for homes and they're building them all through the Southwest and in Mexico. So they're very environmentally friendly. And it reminds me of that concept that you couldn't just build a, a structure with blown concrete, but you can do it over form. And then I guess they remove these, I don't know if they're metal or cardboard, but they, yeah, the, the underlying structure gets removed. Yeah. This is a very, it, this is a very valid point because like when you generate, when you fabric something, when you fabric a shell, 
paradoxically, you don't, you need to have the scaffolds to hold the entire shell. So you always end up, the scaffolds are also a big point of uh, waste in the production process. And so by leveraging the mounds of corner, we were hoping to reduce uh, the amount of, of waste. So definitely a strong inspiration from Louis Turner and, and his work. Uh, yeah. And another question, what's on the mounds again? Where are they located? So they're located, I would say it's Cornell Tech's backyard. And so here is the Cornell Tech is a new campus. It's been six years it it exists. So here you can see the, the different buildings and the mounds are just behind the buildings. Yeah. And it's like ash or something that was disposed of. It's, um, so I'm not sure how the mounds were fabric. Now there is grass on like, um, I'm not sure what is the reason uh, behind it. Like why there are these mounds, but I'm pretty sure they have con like they have projects of expanding and building more, uh, create building more buildings and making the campus bigger. So it's definitely going to eat part of the mounds. I'm sad because like I, I go there on a daily basis and I, I really enjoy uh, having a walk and enjoying this. It's, it's really rare. I don't know if you had the opportunity to visit Roosevelt Island, but it's really, it's a bubble inside the city. It's gorgeous. Not very far away. It's very pastoral. It's very quiet. And um, so it's, it's a little, for me, it's a little bit sad knowing that they're going to have like a project of building like more massive buildings that, yeah. Could you talk a bit more about your background? Yeah, sure. I was, I'm Israeli. I was born here. I grew up in Israel and before moving here, I did my, my undergrad. So I, I'm from, I'm not an architect and I come from more from a mathematics, computer science uh, background and, and in Cornell Tech, I'm exploring this intersection between, uh, um, this is one of many projects where I'm trying to explore the intersection of, uh, of art and data and, and user, how we can incorporate, take these three different spheres, intersect them together and um, to create projects that could have bear some criticism towards uh, social phenomena that shouldn't exist in the first place and create some art installations or installations in general that provoke, provoke thinking and uh, possibly taking action. And, and one more question mm -hmm. of the different, the sort of rendering you have at, at the end that you ended up with of the structure in place on, on the, the Cornell Tech campus. How are the parameters for that final rendering decided on? I guess is, is my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question. Um, so it was, it was very, so we would use, we at ideally, so it's, I would say some between the lines of, so there are like two options. There is something that is uh, completely uh, supervised and something that is completely unsupervised. And when we were working on this model, the optimum was to try and create something that is completely unsupervised. So we would just input the model with the data points, the data points would be transformed into food. And then the, the model would understand by its own, what are the optimal sets of parameters and we just generate a pavilion that optimizes for all the elements that we inserted inside of it. In reality, um, we were, we are very far away from that. Like our, our framework works, but it was to that extent, it was very much supervised. We would uh, try generate different domes with different parameters and we would see, we would run some tests. So we would check how structurally it is stable. Is it visually pleasing? Um, and we would tweak, we tweak the parameters until we found something that is satisfying. So this is an example for an output, but we have a catalog of 100 different out, like dozens of different outputs that were generated with different parameters. Yeah. But ideally, yes, it should be completely unsupervised and the vector of participation would be the data points that are being inserted into the system. Well, can I jump in there? So what did you learn from changing those parameters? Did you come up with another layer that you could use? What sort of did you learn that could help you narrow it down to something that was more suitable for your end goal? And so it's interesting because here we can see, so it's 
fundamentally it's the same set of data points. The, the only difference between the data points is the maximum uh, amount of nodes and the growth rate. So um, the growth rate is basically the, when the Pfizer, when the weaver branches out, it represents how far it branches towards the piece of food that it's trying to explore. So here we can see that the growth rate is growth rate is 0 0.4. So basically the, the node will calculate the distance from the closest piece of food and it would move 40% out of this distance towards the piece of food. And here it would just directly move entirely to the piece of food. And what we can see here is that because it makes a more steps overall, we get structures that are very dense. So here we can see a lot of density, like beams that are being overlaid on top of each other. And also a lot of, and paradoxically, there are also a lot of holes. This is like, there are larger regions that are completely exposed. Whereas here, um, the growth is most systemic, systematic because it only, it grows by the same factor over time. Again, contingent on how the food is distributed in space, but there are the holes, there are some holes, but the holes are much more smaller or smaller. So it's, it is, I think like what I enjoy the most about it's like, sometimes I would try, I would tweak different. So the, it's very, the way it was developed, it's very analytical and the parameters are really well defined. But what's fun about this model is that a user can tweak the different parameters and by really tweaking the parameters, you almost get something that is completely chaotic. I would never uh, anticipate the mod the weaver would behave that way for a growth rate of 0 0.4, maximum nodes of 10 and max distance between nodes 40. It's something that just like we just discovered in the process of tweaking the parameter. Slime holes are really amazing. They pick like the most efficient route. So it, it's very, it's very cool. Not, this is not what I expected, but it's even better. So <laughs> any other questions? Yes. One, one last one. I'm sorry. So would it be interesting if you also created a control, which is, this is what the slime molds did without interaction. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what, one second. I'm, I'm going to be back in one second because there is some, somebody, uh, I'll be back in, sorry, there was somebody ringing in the door. Excuse me. Yes. Can you please, uh, please. Uh, what I was thinking of, it would be interesting for visitors to the pavilion to see what a model would look like of the slime molds, like in the exact same lab conditions, but without human interaction. You know what I'm saying? If you could create a second model, it doesn't, not a big model, but something small so they could see this is what happens to the slime molds given the same conditions without the food being moved around, just like in a pile of food. But I don't know if you can even create a control. Yeah, I think it's, so going back to the, to the I think it's really strongly related to Zachary's uh, question. Um, it's, the, it's really the, the interest. So here, what I'm presenting is like, it's really re refined and uh, we really, we did some, we, I wouldn't say we did cherry picking and presenting what we did here because these are real outputs that we got and we're, it, these are not rare outputs that we, that we got from the set, but it could be, it, it, it is absolutely interesting to try to think how the weaver, what is neutrality? What is the baseline of the weaver when there are no uh, in external interventions uh, from the environment, how the weaver would behave and what's, what is his natural state. And I think it almost becomes like a philosophical question because the, the, the weaver was designed, um, the entire intention around designing the weaver was figuring out how we can use different parameters to inform the growth and decay and, and the creation over time. So it's already by definition biased towards something. But it is an interesting question to think about. I think the question of bias, so just as an overall note, um, it's a very important question, especially when working in algo with algorithms. So in this context, there is no issue of, there is no harmful necessarily issue of bias or understanding what are the biases of your algorithm. But so if I take, for example, a recommendation algorithm, and I know it's a little bit far-fetched, but 
understanding what are the biases in the rec Facebook recommendation algorithm or YouTube recommendation algorithm is very important in informing the design process of an algorithm. So here, thinking about what is the neutral state of the weaver, it, it could also be interesting to understand what are the inherent biases and how maybe how the weaver could be used for uh, uses that are not necessarily have societal positive added value, if that makes sense. Yes. No, the, the weaver could be a metaphor for like Mother Earth without human interaction. Philosophically, mm -hmm. to me, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, but the, but the data also has a bias to it because recycling rates, diversion rates change by the, basically the, Dent, they're related to the density, high density, lower income, and they have less diversion rates. NYCHA housing has terrible diversion rates. So it could really be a physical demonstration of some of those inequities and where um, Vivian and I just retired from a program that was funded by sanitation for, I worked there 20 years. And um, that's always been the big problem is we know these things exist, but having a 3D model of that existence is cool, especially with the holes, the models with the holes in it is, like, hey, look, this is how big this gap is in the data. So that could be a very interesting application of this. But I'm also thinking, ooh, there's flooding data you could use. There's heat map data. There's income data demographic data that could be really cool. You mentioned social statements, that this could be a great application. So when this one dissolves, you can do another one with a, another data set. True. Yeah. It's very flexible. And I would say the next step would be to publicly release this framework and allow artists and designers uh, interact with it and possibly take it to the next level, to the physical realm, starting maybe 3D printing something. Yeah, all options are open. It's very, I'm very proud of it because it, it's very flexible and it's versatile from that perspective. Amazing. So if there are no other questions, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your thoughtful questions. Uh, it was, uh, it was really nice uh, spending uh, the morning with you and sharing uh, some of our findings. Um, I will drop my email. Let's see, chat. So um, here is my email address. Feel free to reach out to me if you have uh, any questions or you want to take the discussion uh, further and uh, brainstorm some other po topics. Uh, I would, as I said, it's, it's a topic that I'm fascinated about and we need more people uh, trying to uh, raise awareness of, about these important topics. I'm here and feel free to reach out to me.